Here we go. All right. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Popular Music Books in Process series, a joint project of IASPM US, the Journal of Popular Music Studies, and the Pop Conference. I'm Carl Wilson, one of the series organizers, along with Kimberly Mack, Francesca Royster, Gus Stadler, and Antonia Randolph, as well as our co-founder, Eric Weisbeard, who's away on a fellowship this year in Sweden. You can find our whole calendar on the IASPM US website under the journal tab and get on the mailing list by contacting Francesca. And you can also catch up on videos of our past sessions on Eric's YouTube channel. On Monday, March 4th, at this same time, we're excited to have Louis Manuel Garcia Mispireta discuss his work together somehow, music, affect, and intimacy on the dance floor with guest Marin Hancock. But right now, we're thrilled to have Matthew D. Morrison here to talk about his new book from the University of California Press, Black Sound, Making Race and Popular Music in the United States. And he's joined by our own Francesca Royster. So some quick backgrounds on our presenters. Matthew D. Morrison is a native of Charlotte, North Carolina, and is an associate professor in the Clive Davis Institute of Recorded Music at NYU. Matthew received his PhD from Columbia in musicology and has held fellowships at the American Council of Learned Studies, uh, Learned Societies, excuse me, Harvard, the Library of Congress, the University of Edinburgh, the Tanglewood Music Center, and the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. His work has appeared in the Journal of the American Musicological Society, the Oxford Handbook of Music and Philosophy, and American Music, among others, and he contributes cre creatively as a dramaturg and artistic consultant in the arts. Francesca T. Royster is a professor of English at DePaul University in Chicago and received her PhD in English from the University of California at Berkeley. Her books include Sounding Like a No-No, Queer Sounds and Eccentric Acts in the Post-Soul Era, Black Country Music, Listening for Revolutions, and Choosing Family, a Memoir of Queer Motherhood and Black Resistance. Black Country Music recently won first place in the 2023 Ralph J. Gleason Music Books Award, and Choosing Family was shortlisted for the 2023 Chicago Review of Books Award for nonfiction. Um, as always, um, mute yourselves for one thing. Somebody out there is not. Um, please post your questions as you think of them in the chat sidebar. And in the last part of the session, Kim will use them to call on you for the Q&A. We also encourage you to use the chat for comments and conversation. And we'll remind our speakers to please ignore the chat during their presentation so we can leave everything to be there to be dealt with in the Q&A. Um, but for everybody's information, we'll send them a top copy of the transcript later so they won't miss anything. And I think that's all you need to know. So please take it away, Matthew and Francesca. Thank you all so much. Francesca, should I go ahead and start here? Yeah, please do. And I'll just say I'm so excited for this meeting of the minds. <laughs> so Absolutely. thank you. All right, Yudi. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much to uh, Pop Music Books and Press for having me. I'm very excited to be here among so many colleagues as we were speaking just before. Um, I feel like this space is one of the spaces that I absolutely wrote this work for um, across the academy and music journalism and music criticism and music writers and, and uh, researchers in general. Um, and so I'm really happy to be able to present this work to you all, especially sort of at the uh, kickoff of the release of my book, which is officially happening uh, next week on March the 5th, although I'm very happy to know and excited that there are those who have already received their copies. Yay. Uh, thanks so much again uh, to the organizers, Kimberly, Antonia, Francesca, Carl, and Eric uh, for their generosity. This is such a generative um, and important space for us that, you know, came out of sort of pandemic needs, but has stuck around because of its significance. And I'm really grateful for that space and that I'm able to be here to uh, engage and participate in it as my book is now out in the world. Uh, and especially thank you to Francesco for being such a kind uh, and generous interlocutor who um, really made sure as we were discussing sort of how to do this. And I was like, well, maybe I could just, you know, talk about it. We have Q&A. And Francesco was like, I'll, I'll hop in here. Why don't we why don't we have a conversation? And I was like, oh, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So thank you so much, Francesca, for uh, holding this space with me. And also, I feel very cared for uh, in talking about and discussing this work along with you in this forum. My um, pleasure. <laughs> Absolutely. And so what I would uh, like to do is to just give you a little bit 
of background on Black Sound as well as the book very briefly, because again, among this audience, um, uh, I imagine that those are, there are those of us who are already in contact with this work in ways. Uh, so I won't belabor that. And also since the book is coming out, but I would like to give you a general idea of what the work is doing and what I'm attempting to do uh, through this concept and through this larger uh, book project. Um, and so let me start off by right away defining Black Sound, right? Black Sound as a sonic complement to Blackface minstrelsy that serves as the aesthetic property and sonic basis of American popular music and entertainment, right? From the 19th century during slavery until now. So that's Black Sound. People ask, what is Black Sound? What is Black Sound? Well, it's a lot of things in the terms of how we're um, conceptualizing and imagining the term, but if we're trying to trace aesthetically and structurally what's happening, this is the most basic definition that I have to offer. Within the de in defining Black Sound and thinking through this concept, which is again coming out of uh, thinking about the legacy of Blackface minstrelsy uh, that I was very um, uh, much guided and led by in courses with Daphne Brooks while I was in grad school at Columbia, as well as, uh, as I mentioned in all of my work with Ellie Hisama, as well as Sadia Hartman, uh, that really is the foundation of this work. Uh, and the book itself, which grows out of the dissertation, uh, but as we know, as books go from dissertation to uh, to this larger work that the narrative shifts a bit and then the focus of what happens uh, really sort of takes shape. And one of the things that really emerged as a critical part of how I was thinking through Black Sound is this idea of property, right? Intellectual property, copyright law, and how we think about these things in an ephemeral moment in which these sort of ontologies of IP and copyright were being developed in the first place. Uh, and so the book itself is divided. Uh, am I am I is it okay audio audio wise for everyone? Okay, uh, the book itself is divided into two parts. Part one, uh, racial identity and popular music in early blackface, where I am for the focusing specifically on the antebellum era. And I should also be clear, as within the book, that my work is scaffolded is built upon uh, the work. Uh, that has been done extensively, right, in American studies and music studies and Black studies on the legacy of Blackface minstrelsy. And so I like to make sure that as this concept seems to sort of find its way uh, into various parts of the academy and beyond, uh, that I am clear that my work is very much built in conversation and as a part of work that exists, you know, very much around these critical lenses on Blackface before mine. Uh, and so really kind of revisiting uh, the antebellum era of blackface performance uh, by trying to really consider what the aesthetic and sonic dimensions, really imagining what these performance practices were like, how they shaped notions of racial identity and performance, not just the sort of making of whiteness through white fantasies of blackness, right? But also how these sort of performances of blackness and the formation of whiteness through these performances also impact and shape the way that black people are perceived in real time in the context of the United States, as well as how we come to invest in notions of racial authenticity through performance, right? So this first half, again, is really looking at the, the uh, antebellum era, uh, ending with, uh, so beginning with Jim Crow, Zip Coon, and Lucy Long, and some early Blackface char characters, uh, moving into the formalized sort of uh, stage production of Blackface minstrelsy uh, in the mid in the mid 19th century, focusing on one of the few Blackface performers of that era, William Henry Master Jubilee, as well as the movement from the United States to the United Kingdom and what that means in terms of the establishment of a commercial music industry in the 19th century during slavery, right, across the Atlantic. And then concluding that section with Stephen Foster and the composition of Americana, uh, really sort of looking at the sort of close of the antebellum era and how we sort of see blackface becoming the central um, and standard practice of popular music consumption in the United States and how composition and copyright begins to develop out of that in the popular music vein. Part two, the birth of the popular music industry. Uh, so I kind of moved from the antebellum era to the end of the Civil War directly to the turn of the 20th century uh, because I wanted to signal uh, this transition from these ephemeral performance practices developed out of blackface, right, in theaters, in, in local performance halls, through sheet music, and how that began to materialize differently in the 
structural development of the industry of popular music that emerges at the end of the 19th century, right, along the same time that many other major American industries were built during the Gilded Age that helped to lay the foundation for this country economically, culturally, politically, and otherwise, as well as how that development directly informs and sh or is informed by the creation of mechanical reproduction technologies right and how our negotiation of these technologies are very much still tethered to the legacy of blackface aesthetically as well as how blackface performance shaped our notions of intellectual property uh, and so that's the sort of scope and aim of the larger project itself uh, and today i would like to focus on reading one excerpt <clears throat> from chapter one uh, chapter one slavery in the making of black sound and black face where i try to rehear uh, Jim Crow, Zip Coon, and Lucy Long, the three sort of stock blackface characters that really helped to create the watershed uh, sort of moment in which blackface becomes the primary, you know, source of commercial entertainment in the United States in the 19th century. Okay, let me drink some water before I read this whole thing here. All right, um, and I'm very much looking forward to engaging in your questions, and so if I feel like it's 5.13 now, um, uh, this is about a seven minute excerpt and I may cut it down a bit if, if, I, if I think we can move through. So the excerpt, if anyone has the book by chance, is page 58 uh, of the book. Uh, this is the hard copy, which UC Press put the image on the hard copy too, which I was just very surprised and excited and related about. They just really did a beautiful job. Thank you, UC Press uh, and my fantastic editors there. Okay, so Misrepresenting Black Womanhood, Lucy Long. That is the title of the subheading that I'm going to read from chapter one. While Jim Crow and Zip Coon were two of the most popular early blackface caricatures, it was the cross-dressed blackface character of, of Lucy Long who became the most frequently performed blackface trope during the formalization of the form in the 1850s and 60s. This popular stereotype would begin to define the way in which Black women, as well as many queer identities outside of the normative binary construction of white men and women, were seen, heard, and imagined through the white gaze. White male anxieties around sexuality, miscegenation, and other gendered and sexual fantasies were exercised through drag performance and Blackface. Lucy Long was a Blackface impersonation of Black women and womanhood on the menstrual stage. It became a stock character in popular theater after it was first introduced in the late 1820s. Lucy Long is, in fact, one of the first and most popular enduring representations of drag performance in American culture. Let me just repeat that again. Lucy Long is, in fact, one of the first and most enduring representations of drag performance in American popular commercial culture in particular. Quote, when George Washington Dixon named Rose's predicaments in the interlude he called Love in a Cloud, he apparently established a convention of blackface wench, male actors representing black women in drag through his song, Cold Black Rose, end quote. George Washington Dixon was a famous performer uh, who kind of preceded and performed uh, at the same time that Jim Crow, uh, that T.D. That Rice uh, became really known for jumping Jim Crow and helping to inaugurate blackface. But Dixon was already around doing these things. By the time Dixon introduced this racist and sexist to, uh, to reference my e, uh, Moya Bailey's form formation of misogyny noir, uh, when he began to fasten this comedic stereotype of Black women to the American public, iterations of a cross-dressed Black-faced figure had already appeared on stage in the famous Tom and Jerry or Life in London, performed in London in 1821 and in the United States in 1823. Quote, Moncrief's stage direction specified that white male actors were cross-dressed to play the roles of the fast black women, Sally and Flashy Nance, end quote. But similar to how Zip Coon became the most popular representation of the black dandy in blackface after the introduction of My Long Tail Blue in 1827, Lucy Long emerged as one of the most celebrated blackface tunes. The song introduced stereotyped conceptions of black womanhood to the popular stage in the United States and the United Kingdom between 1843 and 52. So as I discuss in my work, in any presentation that I do, 
Uh, I am very careful about how I engage with displaying these images and playing the sounds of blackface because these images and these sounds have been central and crucial to the construction of anti-blackness, of racism, uh, have fueled the ways that we have come to understand uh, racist notions of identity and performance in a white supremacist society. And so our engagement with these materials, with these lyrics, with these images uh, should not be one of fascination, but one of really self-reflection to help us think about the continued impact of how Blackface determines the way that even I and others have to negotiate our purposes and identities in the larger world, right? So such representations were created mostly by white men in Blackface whose presentations were, were of Lucy Long helped to place Black women largely outside of the realm of femininity, typically afforded to white women in the antebellum era and imagination. While Jim Crow and Zip Coon <clears throat> emerge as the most popular stock caricatures of early Blackface, they are gendered specifically as male. Zip Coon would sometimes be represented as feminine, thereby further posing as a masculine and or heterosexually normalized white male or as a sexually deviant queer black man. It might be assumed that these racialized cross-dress performances allowed for the subversion of gender norms by mostly white men who perpetuated the roles, but as gender studies pioneer Drew the Butler notes that, quote, there is no necessary relation between drag and subversion and the drag may well be used in the service of both the denaturalization and re-idealization of hyperbolic heterosexual gender norms, end quote. As the homosocial nature of blackface allowed for expression of gender, class, race, and sexuality to be defined mostly by white men of various ethnic and class backgrounds in blackface, quote, the search for a secured masculine identity required that a fantasy of a living female be performed and thus became the advent of the prima donna female impersonator as integral to minstrelsy, end quote. Lucy Long and related blackface cross-dress archetypes are cases through which to interrogate what C. Riley Snorton names as, quote, a critical genealogy of modern transness as chattel persons gave rise to understanding of gender as immutable and as an amendable form of being, end quote. The impact of white men in blackface and drag had on perceptions of Black womanhood and gender expression in general cannot be understated. The rise of pop entertainment through Blackface during the Jacksonian and antebellum era was a moment in which the anxieties around class, gender, race, and sexuality were expressed and maintained. Thereby, the popularity and performance of Black drag characters like Lucy Long is an opportunity to consider how womanhood, heteronormative, Black women, queer performativity, femininity and trans identity are bound within the performed scripts of female blackface stereotypes that were controlled mostly by white men. Lucy Long's tunes, like Jim Crow and Zip Coon, ironically borrowed directly from Irish and Scottish folk tunes. And I'll end there. Wow, that was really um, just so profound, Matthew. And um, you know, just reminding us of the ways that these constructions of Blackness kind of intersectionally with gender are still, you know, with us, you know, still with the, the power to shock, but also the power, um, you know, it still informs our popular entertainment and, um, you know, also the experience of bodies, you know, in everyday life, which I think is a really important dimension of your book. Um, and so I'd, I was thinking about, you know, how you started as you were thinking about this attempt to rehear, um, to hear performances, some of which we have, you know, recordings of and, and some of which we don't, um, the sensitivity that that takes. And um, with that, um, just wondering if you wanted to talk about your own experience as an artist and as a performance as it's informed the ways that you're imagining these moments and also theorizing them. Sure, sure. Thank you so much uh, for that, Francesca. Um, so I am a uh, classically trained violinist and I was also, but I began that classical training 
in the Black church and in the AME church in Charlotte, North Carolina. Shout out to Miss Doris Jones, who is still one of the, who is still the primary keyboardist at my home church. Uh, Miss Doris Jones is uh, my granddad, age 84 years old. Okay, and still we still be playing up and down when I go home. Um, but at any rate, uh, Miss Jones was my first uh, music teacher, but she had me started playing hymns. And then I began uh, in violin and Suzuki. And then eventually, after stopping private for like one year at a community art school, I started orchestra in public high school. And so I've always had this sort of dual trajectory. You know, it makes us think about Du Bois and double consciousness in ways, right? But they weren't things that were in opposition to me. They were very much connected because, again, I was learning and singing, you know, this repertoire and hearing my aunties and the other, you know, opera singers in church, you know, within the gospel tradition, uh, really sort of uh, blending these ideas, not just of the sacred and the secular, but of like the classical and the popular, right? Um, and so when I went into at studying violin at Morehouse and then going on to uh, teach middle high school orchestra, performance has always been very central to how uh, I thought about my own self, right? Uh, and so this is how performance studies became sort of right away uh, attracted to me as a scholar because I was I, I, be I began to be able to relate my own understanding of what it means to sort of think about and um, reflect on who you are in relation to an audience and how you want that audience to receive you through a musical transaction, right? And so, it, you know, as to think about how that forms into the performance of identity and then the relationship between identity and performance as a medium, you know, became very, you know, those two things kind of developed alongside for me. Um, and so because I entered into musicology as a, uh, focused on Western classical music, but also still very much aware of my person, my identity, and sort of how I thought about uh, my own relationship to the world as a Black man from the South, right? Um, what, what then began to sort of really stick out to me in the graduate class I was taking at Columbia with Karen Henson, it was a class on the physiognomies of opera, right? So we we're looking at, you know, the, the uh, physicality of opera and the performance of opera and the reception of opera. And one of the things that I was just thinking, I was like, well, dang, uh, are there any, do, is there any engagement with Black people who were in opera as performers or wrote opera? Like, you know, clearly, you know, I understood Jesse Norman and, and Leontine Price as these major composers. And I also had a bit of an idea of Black composers uh, of opera from when I was at Morehouse because we very much championed Black composers at the in HBCUs. Um, mm -hmm. But it was that class that got me thinking critically about the relationship between race, performance, and sort of the industries of how music circulates, right? Uh, and then again, you know, moving right into, I believe, that next semester, taking those three classes with Daphne Brooks, Sadia Hartman, um, um, uh, and Ellie Hasama. Uh, you know, the, the class with Ellie Hasama was race and pop music, okay? The class with Daphne Brooks was Black feminist musical subcultures, right? Uh, and the black, the class um, with Sadia Hartman and Tina Compt was haunted visualities of certain senses of race. So, like, I was dropped there, I feel like, in between these three moments after having really been thinking about I wrote a paper in an opera class on like you know what does it mean to be a black performer in opera and how are you received on stage so I was already getting into thinking about this idea of masking right in different ways but not in a specific context of blackface but once I was in that class in those three classes and particularly in a black feminist musical subcultures class right which really be becomes liner notes of a revolution and this was back in 2010 right mm -hmm. um um, we spent like six weeks on blackface, you know, and me being the know-it-all graduate student that I was at the time, right? I'm like, Daphne, you know, Professor Brooks, why are we still talking about blackface? She was like, look, you'll figure it out, okay? <laughs> yeah, like, there's a reason. Uh, and, and me figuring it out turned into a dissertation project with similar questions that I had about performance, about embodiment, right? About how these things also circulate through, through commercial commodities and then how those commercial commodities are are indistinguishable, right, from the systems and structures uh, that um, that are at the base of the people who create and consume these commodities, right? So that's how it kind of moved into uh, my, my relationship to performance, uh, into this sort of idea of how I've come into thinking about Black sound, right, as an embodied concept that is looking through sound and performance and other ways of um, uh, 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 other disciplines, right, to sort of really think about uh, the aliveness of ephemeral performances that we may not be able to capture directly in the way that we would like to, but that very much live and what it means to try to reimagine those constructions and then sort of break down and analyze their meaning and their resonance into today. 
Wow, that's fantastic. And to be a fly on the ceiling and or fly on your shoulder to follow you to class, you know, and that that year just sounds amazing. Um, well, maybe you can talk a little bit more about the your choices in terms of the people that emerge. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, who were the major figures, but also like how did you decide who would get the the space, take up the space. Um, how did you make those choices? Yes, yes. Uh, I really like that. Uh, this idea of how did I decide? Uh, because, you know, as, as we know, those of us who do this work here, that although on the one hand, it's not easy to really um, reconstruct what these ephemeral, you know, live performances were in the 19th century, uh, that there is just a lot of stuff out there that talks about them in different ways, but you may have to sort of explore uh, you know, other avenues and archives. And that was another thing that really informed my practice was, was Black feminist studies uh, and this idea of challenging what is an archive, what is the archive, and how do we sort of look for erasures in the archive that we know are there, but that we cannot find or contain because of white supremacy, okay? And those structures that shape, you know, who does and does not appear or how they appear in those archives, uh, right? And so because I was informed by that Black feminist practice of archival study, um, uh, I began, I felt like I could, felt like I could just kind of look in places uh, that were obvious, like sheet music, right? But do it through the lens of, again, combining performance studies and sound studies and historical musicological studies and music theory, and even, you know, sort of a historical ethnographic approach to try to reconstruct things, right? Uh, to then sort of, you know, see what materializes and what comes through. And in doing that, you know, I'm moving through uh, legal ledgers, right? So, you know, uh, thinking about, um, you know, how in court, if I'm trying to like figure out what's happening in like earlier performances before we even get to uh, the antebellum era, like, you know, there are lots of legal ledgers that talk in various ways about the experiences of enslaved people, even though it might be informed by, but there may be, you know, clues there. This is a place that a lot of people look who will try to reconstruct certain narratives of enslaved people's right. Uh, to then, you know, one of the things that I came across um, as I was doing the uh, preliminary work was uh, one of the figures that emerges in the book uh, as a primary case study uh, are the Whitmarks, right, in Whitmark and Sons uh, of the early sort of development of Tim Alley in the modern music industry. And the way that they came about is because uh, all uh, so much of the literature um, on the history of American pop for the music, you know, there was so much written in the mid 20th century, uh, trying to then, you know, trying to give credence to American pop for the music and sort of Tim Pan Alley and that sort of standard to say that, you know, these things are as important. Charles Hamm and music and musicology, for example, is like, hey, this is the golden, you know, the 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 standard popular song. Like there's stuff, there's something here, you know, Schubert shows up in this thing, and then they're doing new things, right? Um, and so uh looking at the sort of emergence and the literature uh, around American pop music history that was really kind of written in the mid 20th century, the Whitmarks kept coming up, right? Uh, and and it was obvious that they were like a critical part of the uh, development of Tim Pan Alley, but I was really curious, like, is this a narrative that's been constructed by the Whitmarks that other people have taken up, or like, is this a real thing? And so then it winds up that, you know, at Columbia, the Whitmark, they had the Whitmarks catalog, uh, the Whitmark Papers, right? It's the Whitmarks Papers, uh, who was the main brother that founded uh, the Whitmark and Sons Publishing House. And there was, it was just, it was a treasure trove, right? Uh, and so in the dissertation, the Whitmarks emerged as a major case to think about the development of Tempan Alley, uh, because through my secondary research, they kept coming up as an object that also happened to have a whole archive at Columbia where I was doing my PhD, right? So, in, in way in, in that way, there are certain figures who emerge, you know, through deep research and also, you know, serendipity that there happened to be an archive there that made sense for me to like really be able to focus on it. Um, and then other figures um, come, uh, other figures came much later uh, or uh, much later in the process. Uh, and I would say that, well, well one, this was all, this, all, all of this is very, uh, is very much spirit work for me. So this is intellectual labor. Right. Uh, this is professional labor. You know, I wrote this book for also to get to, to go towards my tenure file. OK, um, so, you know, those things are real. Um, but also in the process of writing this book that I knew very clearly 
right, that I was being asked to do a certain type of spirit work on behalf of those who have called upon me, right? Uh, and I believe in that very much. And so honestly, Francesca, there are times that I came across certain figures or cases that I don't even remember how I got there. It was like, it was, I was just doing like, even when we help you go through archives and things, just kind of like, oh my goodness, where did that come from? That happened quite a bit as well, right? So Mama Lou, who I start the book with, is an example of a figure uh, who at first was at the end of the dissertation, but then as I was sort of like reconstructing the narrative and thinking about who was important, you know, what cases I need to reconsider, where I needed to uh, add new ideas and characters and, 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 and uh, study, case studies, right? Uh, Mama Lou uh, is someone who happened to come up in a court case I was I was looking at, and I was like Tarara Bundie, Mama Lou, and then there and then uh, so, like the, all these like little pieces started to come together, and then I was like, wait a minute, no one really has anything in detail to say about Mama Lou, but they all are saying something very similar about her innovation of these musical practices in St. Louis at this time, and so then that led me to right uh really sort of investigating and trying to unpack and rediscover what her legacy was that i felt like was very much in conversation with the idea and concept of black sound and honestly i did not know really what black sound fully was until the book was finished but i knew that these characters you know were in many ways representative of the the the, the way that black sound developed in relation to blackface over the course of the 19th 20th century into the 20th I really appreciate that because um, in your, you know, in your discussion of spirit work and just the care that you're bringing to our archival practice, um, it's also allowing for a space of agency and, um, you know, if not resistance, at least resilience by, you know, the folks who are, who are the actors that you're, you're talking about. And I think that that's really important to hang on to. I can totally see um, Daphne and Sadia's um, like uh, visions too there um, in concert with yours. So I think that that's really important work. And, um, you know, something I think is so innovative about your project is the ways that you're bringing in legal theory mm -hmm. uh, and really getting us to pay attention to that. And maybe you can talk a little bit about that. Like, do you think that... Um, musicologists, music writers need to grapple more with uh, copyright and how do you see yourself as kind of modeling and teaching how we can pay more attention to that? Sure, thank you so much for uh, that. So the the property question came up for me early on, uh, again, through uh, Black studies and Black feminist studies, right? Because uh, much of the work, especially around the 19th century, looks at the different ways that property is understood in relation to slavery, but also beyond the sale of the enslaved person. Uh, and so, uh, and especially in scenes of subjection and Hartman's discussion uh, of how we think about uh, performance, right, from the perspective of the auction block, but then how that is always bound uh, with economy, right, and bound uh, with how we think about how people are read legibly as sources of property. And then that makes me, uh, I came uh, soon after the dissertation, uh, the fabulous book that I always like to reference, Katrina Dion Thompson's Ring Shot Will About, uh, is just a brilliant uh, piece of work that I think looks, at, it, it's not looking directly at copyright law per se, but uh, her focus on the sort of uh, digging through um, um, uh, remnants of sort of legal discussions of people's uh, uh, enslaved people, especially enslaved girls and women, uh, really shows the ways that even through the Middle Passage, how Black uh, African descended peoples and African peoples were imagined as sources of property to also be understood through their bodies and through movement and through maintenance and through all these other sort of conditions, all right, even under the Middle Passage. Uh, and so, and then Stephen Best's work, right, uh, claimed to me, uh, I was introduced to, and uh, sort of later than I wish I had been, uh, but it, it, it came maybe uh, at the point where I was really beginning to write the book uh, uh, after PhD, uh, but it was also l fortunate for me because he had done so much deep theoretical work, right, on sort of getting us to understand the different ways that property um, has been shaped by, uh, by slavery, right? And so, 
Uh, I was working through property in relation to performance and enslavement and slavery, but I honestly, and then I was, it was percolating in the dissertation around copyright and property and like how these things, how property and slavery and property and performance and property in the auction block and property and copyright. I was like, okay, there's a lot of property and I don't know what I'm doing with all these different notes of the property. <laughs> and so like, how do I work this out? Uh, and then I'm again, the, which meant I had to do sort of like deep study on the different ways that property is understood in these various contexts. And fortunately for me, uh, as I was doing this work, there emerges, right, a discourse within legal studies of critical race and intellectual property studies, right? Uh, and so Anjali Vats at the University of Pittsburgh, uh, whose book, The Color of Creatorship, right, is one of these sort of works that helps to inaugurate this, this uh, study of critical race and IP, both in for practicing lawyers, right, as well as legal scholars. Uh, and then you also have the work of people like K.J. Green, who for a long time have already been writing from the legal perspective in law publications, right, about reparations and tying that to this idea, right, of how property has been understood uh, in copyright law and how that does not fully jive with Black musical practices or the history of pop music, right? Uh, and so these things kind of come after I really lean into the idea of property, and but they also... Uh, uh, but I'm also coming after uh, how property is understood from the context of slavery and performance. And so putting these two uh, sort of things together, I began to uh, really sort of think about how do we understand why property is, under, it, why property is, um, or, or, or to ask the question about the status of property in music as being connected to uh, what is deemed to be legible. Right. So sheet music, you know, is the original source of music property in the context of U.S. copyright law. Uh, and what we find, you know, as I, as it's written about and as I try to unpack here, is that our modes of analyzing what is music property in the first place, whether it is sheet music or not, is still based on this idea of what is legible right to its reader. OK. And then we, when we also think about the ways that property in the 19th century and music property in particular um, is uh, in primarily the domain of uh, white male music industrialists, right, uh, especially during slavery. Uh, so how do we understand the um, the taking up of these aesthetics, both real and imagined of black performance in the development of this new commercial form of popular music that lays the foundation for American pop that also becomes a new source of music property to be contained through sheet music that is also under their control. Right. So I began to try to piece these things together uh, to really uh, create a robust foundation to support right, the work that is already done on understanding uh, the erasure and the exploitation of Black musical practices in the long ago history of American popular music, uh, as well as what can be done to repair that, which is reparations and also new considerations uh, for how we even imagine what property is in the first place with the music. Wow, that's um, so powerful, like just um, so striking to think about like this category of of the legible and reproducible um, and what that leaves out in terms of Black improvisation, creativity, the creative process, um, you know, and really like those original um, kinds of creative moments that um, are ephemeral, that sometimes get lost to us. And what you let us think about is like really an important moment to think about, like, how do we get where we are now, where these notions of authenticity and racial performance that's repeatable um, become such a, um, you know, a creative straitjacket, especially, I think, for artists of color. Um, so, yeah, maybe you can tell us a little bit more about like the legacy of Black Sound and um, some of the debates that we're in right now in terms of um, <laughs> who gets to who gets to create and who gets to invent. Right, right, right. Um, so in terms of the, uh, the, the there's, you know, black country. Hello. <laughs> we could we could start yeah. there. Right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, you've given us so much to think about uh, there by also providing these histories and these legacies and showing the ways that uh, both past and contemporary artists try to wrestle with their own relationship to uh, sounds that are understood as country, but that we also know are coming from 
uh, spaces that were constructed as country, even if it was the blues or if it was, you know, black rural folk string band music and these other styles that, you know, uh, uh, get sort of left out of the fold when they come into the commercial music market. Um, and, and so um, I'm trying to, th I'm trying to think about who, um, wait, ask me that one more time, Francesca, because I, I don't want to, I don't want to veer. I was about to. Um, okay. Yeah. Actually, I'm not sure what I said either, but, um, but yeah, thinking for sure about the ways that the legacy of black sound as it was constructed as being kind of legible, um, is connected to the the history and debate now of who gets to invent and who gets Absolutely. to own, really own. <laughs> Absolutely. So one of the one of the reasons that uh, George Lewis, my advisor at Columbia, you know, when as I was working through the subject, uh, you know, it wasn't really clear at all what black sound was. I had no. I was. I was. I knew it was something. I felt it. And George is like, you know, um, well. It was like, you know, you got something there with that concept. So work that concept out, <laughs> right? Uh, but don't let, you know, the theory, like, like do the work and then see how it then gets informed, uh, right, by by the work that comes, by, by the research that you that you do there. Uh, and one of the things that, you know, I hypothesize just because of experience and what we kind of generally see and witness, right, uh, but wanted to make sure to trace uh, was the matter of fact that every single genre of American popular music, okay, commercially uh, as it stands, uh, has some root or relationship uh, to Black performance, whether real or imagined, beginning with Blackface until today. And that the ways in which the development of commercial music styles and genres, right, is created, and as we as we understand in this con as we understand in this community, right, is directly racialized. Uh, and becomes a part of a larger construction of how we imagine our personal, individual, and collective communal identities, right, uh, show up in a sonic and in a cultural and in a performative sense, uh, while, they, while we also negotiate that relationship uh, according to the uh, ways that popular culture and music circulates to, to, to also sort of inform our ideas about ourselves, right? So both in terms of like the musical practices that we take up ourselves, that we feel and are connected to as part of how we imagine who we are in our communities, and then also how we are in turn impacted by the commercial marketing and circulation of musical performances and styles uh, that are attributed or connected to certain groups of peoples, right? Uh, and so I'll say all that to say, uh, that, you know, in this particular uh, context right now where we are, there's not a debate around country music. Uh, I mean, the, so there, is, there, clearly, there clearly is a debate, okay? But it is not debatable, right, uh, of the place and the legacy and the history, both in the past and the present, that Black people have in country music. And it's very obvious and clear, and I hope that so much, even more so after reading Black Sound, that the desire to, or the need to, or the impetus, right, to try to assign a particular racial identity or category uh, to a group of, uh, to a style of music in order to keep other people out of that is about the same thing that nation building in the United States around white supremacy is also about, right? Uh, and so there are, there, I think that one of the things I try to throw, show through Black Sound is that whether we remove the Black face mask right, which is about a negotiation of American popular music, right, through these racialized notions of identity and performance, whether and once, even with that removed, right, there is still blackness in some way, again, whether real or imagined, that is at the center of the ways in which these different musical styles are developed, especially as we continue to have the regular pattern of new musical styles and innovations being developed in localized Black musical contexts that may have some relationship, of course, to other peoples who are non-Black and, and may develop, of course, in some more integrated settings. But what we find most frequently and most often in the history of popular music in America is that there are innovations developed by Black Americans from ragtime to the blues to gospel to rhythm and blues to rock and roll to disco to house to EDM that begin locally and then travel commercially to the larger sort of commercial music market, right? Uh, and then that takes a new shape depending on how it's marketed, how it's categorized, 
who uh, the money sort of goes behind to become the representative of this thing, just like rock and roll in the mid 1950s, right, where you have these crossover hits, right, that are actually counterfeit hits uh, of people like Pat Boone singing Luna Richards, Tutti Frutti, you know, because copyright laws determined that an actual record was not copyrightable. So it was actually was legal for those uh, companies in many ways to re-record those songs and press them for these new artists. But how is it that these artists become associated with this genre and then the investment, right, in sort of uplifting, you know, uh, white artists uh, in the commercial sense uh, within these musical styles that become racialized as such, again, is also about a certain investment in whiteness as a source of property, right, uh, as is discussed in the legal sense, as well as in a sort of source of collective identity that gets severely disrupted right, when anyone who does not fit in that idea of a collective identity is somehow uh, imagined to be a part of it historically or at present. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Everything that you said, Matthew. Um, and I was I was thinking about like folks like, of course, Prince or even George Clinton or Stevie Wonder, you know, mm -hmm. artists who have made it their business to directly engage, um, even thinking about like um, um, Big Mama Thornton, um, like really Willie Mae Thornton, like thinking about um, her, um, people who have uh, have have gone to kind of legal means to control or at least attempt to control their music. But is there any way outside out of this um, system, you know, given it's the structural, um, you know, foundations of the industry? You know, Francesca, uh, uh, is there any way out of that system, right? Is there any way out of this system, this system being these United States? Right. Uh, I honestly feel like those two questions are directly connected. Uh, but to also give you a real answer, I guess, <laughs> uh, you know, the part of the work that I'm hoping to do uh, as as black, as this moves forward right now that the book is finished, uh, I'm really excited about being connected to legal scholars, to entertainment lawyers, to, you know, practicing folks who are writing amicus briefs and legal briefs. I'm not really interested, I'm not not really, I'm not interested at all uh, in taking up the place uh, 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 of forensic musicologists on court cases. Uh, that's not my desire because I do not believe that the law is written in a way that fairly is able to even adjudicate, right, what's happening in a lot of these cases in the first place. So I'm not really interested in that, but what I am interested in is trying to figure out how to take these things, right, and present them to people who can make changes. Like people need deep research in order to make moves and make decisions, right? And so creating amicus briefs, right? Trying to educate uh, the general populace in different communities of people. So young music creators, my students, number one, right? Uh, other students and creators to be able to understand what they're, to understand one, that music is never created in a vacuum. Uh, two, that you, know, you are a human being who is creating music in relation to other people. And three, that all these laws and things exist that you need to be aware of so that you can know how to navigate and understand them and know that the system is set up to exploit you. So how do you sort of strategically plan, you know, your development as an artist and uh, as you sort of present yourself to the world for commercial consumption? How do you maintain as much control over that as possible? And knowing these histories, right, understanding how other artists have moved through, I think is something that is a critical uh, part of that. But again, I'm very interested in trying to impact as long as the laws exist, because I believe that the laws should be abolished, just like uh, this country, as long as it exists in the way that it does. Okay, just to be clear, that's my particular relationship to these things. Um, uh, but until that happens, there are ways that we can uh, there are ways that we can try to intervene and shift right the laws themselves. And because I've seen the work that legal scholars have been able to do who can sort of, you know, say, okay, Congressman, you have no idea about copyright, but this is what's happening. You need to listen to this so that when you go in there and make a suggestion for an amendment to, or, or in addition to an actor, so that it's informed by these things, right? And again, that's, a, you know, it's all kinds of complicated things going into those politics, but, you know, I believe in trying to poke at stuff from all kinds of directions, right? And so that's kind of where I sit with on that. Absolutely. I really, um, I think that that's so powerful and, 
it makes me think about um, something that journalist Marcus Dowling said, which is, you know, that sometimes showing up, being a witness and being involved can make cultural change in terms of, especially mm -hmm. in terms of the ways that um, Black voices aren't counted as actors, you know, in their own legal decisions. Mm -hmm. So for sure. Um, well, do you think we should uh, turn to questions? What do you think? Sure, I think that sounds good. Mm. Thank you so much, Francesca, for those questions too. All yeah. right. Yeah, that was great. Thank you both. Okay, so why don't we open it up? Let's start with uh, Elijah Wald has a question. If you wanna maybe unmute Elijah and ask your question. Yeah, sure. Um, no, it was a very simple question. Are you hearing me? Am mm -hmm. I unmuted? Okay, it was a very simple question. I was just curious. Um, I was excited to hear that you're writing about Mama Lou. Um, I've just been doing some stuff about her in my new book. And I was just curious whether you're writing about her strictly as a mythic figure or whether you're also writing about Louise Rogers and, and you know, sort of mixing in her real life with that. Yeah, thanks so much for that uh, question, Elijah. So uh, Mama Lou is in, in the introduction here. Uh, primarily because I am looking at, so I'm looking at Mama Lou uh, as she was just in terms of, uh, so I'm, I'm getting to Mama Lou by the time that she's already performing, right? Uh, and I, I get some hints at who she was sort of as, as in, in background, right? But I am not trying to do a sort of recovery history here uh, of Mama Lou in particular within the introduction. What I'm trying to do is actually focus here on this, uh, as you sort of say here, the mythic role but the mythic role that is informed quite a bit uh, by a lot of writing on her as a significant performer at the late 19th century. So I'm very excited. Uh, one of the things that I have thought about for sure uh, is doing more deep study on Mama Lou as the performer her herself, uh, but I did feel like that would have carried me in a different direction uh, uh, for what the uh, sort of purposes of this book were. And what I really wanted to do was also uh, put Mama Lou further on the map to have more studies done yeah. on her by other so people. I feel like I needed to do all of that work. So it's really exciting to me that uh, you are doing work on Mama Lou, the person here. Cool. Thank you. Okay, uh, Carl Wilson has another question for you. you Want to unmute Carl? Yeah, um, thanks so much. This conversation has been so interesting and I'm excited about the book. Um, I was really struck when in your reading of the excerpt that you pointed to and, and you paused over it. So I assume that you have a lot of thoughts about it too, pointing to <laughs> Lucy Long as a foundational figure in American drag performance. Um, mm. Can you talk a little bit more about that and how that lineage persists into the present, especially in modern commercial media uses of drag, but not just that, wherever yeah. you think it goes. Sure, sure. Thanks so much for that, Carl. Um, excuse me. So one of the things about uh, the book itself, the thing, the dissertation, I feel like it was, it tried to attend a bit to gender and the sexuality, right? Because I felt like I had to include everything in it. Uh, and then I got to the book and I was like, well, it's the characters themselves tell stories that, you know, cross the spectrum of gender and sexuality, but it still is not a deep study of that. And I have a line in the book that says, you know, I would, it would be wonderful if other people would take up, you know, this sort of like really expand the way that blackface and particularly Lucy Long shapes these notions of conception of gender uh, and performance. But in terms of the uh, sort of drag lineage, right? Uh, so the suggestion is not necessarily that drag performance starts with Lucy Long because we know that cross-dressing has a very long history in theatrical performance, right? Uh, but that very much in the same way that blackface minstrelsy emerges as the first original form of commercial entertainment, Right, that this particular style of racist cross face drag, uh, racist cross dressed black drag performance uh, that, that is also directly a part of developing American comedic entertainment and comedy, right, uh, becomes a major component of how we imagine uh, the sort of uh, 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 burlesque comedic uh, style of drag performance. Uh, that we still see today that also is heavily racialized, right? Um, I'm not going to go into RuPaul's Drag Race. Uh, uh, <laughs> sorry, I, I'm not, I mean, I could, but I feel it's already 555. That, because that's a whole other segment, right? Uh, but, there, but, I, but to your point, though, Carl, I mean, to your question, though, Carl, um, 
I do think that the complexities, right, are performing and representing. Uh, I think the first point that I want the one to be clear about Lucy Long is that it is uh, responsible, its performance and the investment in its character is responsible for limiting, right, the perceptions and the way that Black women sort of have to uh, uh, exist within the confines of society, even though in, on the daily, all day, you know, uh, Black women and films are finding ways and, and, and existing outside of those structures, right? But in terms of the larger sort of structural sense of the impact, right, uh, that's the main point that I want to make, that this becomes a stand-in, right? And, and, and during enslavement, you know, on the theatrical stage, as people are, you know, believing that these are true representations for uh, in a number of ways. Um, but then one of the things that I do, uh, if I would have kept reading, I would have went on to talk about Mary Jones, Peter Siwali, right, of the 19th century, who a number of people write about, Tavanya Nyong'o writes about, C. Riley Snorton writes about, uh, Peter Siwali, who uh, they, you know, I, I wouldn't want to give them a specific uh, uh, pronoun now, you know, and I also don't want to sort of impose one on them retroactively, right, but uh, Peter Siwali, uh, Mary Jones, uh, who was noted as dressing as a woman, right? Uh, who talked about themselves balls in Harlem in the mid 19th century, in which it was not uncommon, right, to be amongst other people in her in their community who were dressed in these ways, right? So these Harlem balls of of the era, um, and how, and then also the way that they were written about in the penny press, right, over and over, and how that becomes related to the blackface caricatures of Lucy Long, right, as Mary Jones slash Peter Savali was also very much in this, you know, space of entertainment and leisure and, and right, and uh, and performance, right, uh, of, of, and of one's own self through drag. And so there are just so many layers, I think, to unpack that I would love, again, if other folks were interested in exploring and sort of really sort of digging up some of those legacies and histories, I think would be uh, really um, uh, super. Thank you. I was just, I was just thinking about that legacy. Um, uh, recent recently in my my music class, we were watching Elvis performing on Milton Borough and all the layers of different kinds of drag performances that are kind of ghosting that performance. Whether it's Milton Borough's many um, femme drag um, examples of femme drag, and then Elvis, of course, like doing racial and gender drag you know, in that one episode. But I definitely think that um, that it's an, uh, that gender is such an important part of the ways that um, that Black sound is, is kind of moving, for sure. Hey, um, so Hannah Maltz, you have two questions. I'm wondering if maybe you could choose one for now, and if there's time, we can get to the second one later. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, yes. Um, so for the it, the second one, um, have you seen any interest in your students lately in like the songwriters unions or producer unions or engineer unions? Like I've seen the hundred percenters on Instagram. It looks like a coalition of songwriters in LA, mostly black women songwriters who are mm -hmm. trying to be recognized as a union. Is anyone interested or talking about that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, thank you so much for that question, Hannah. Hannah, who has taken a number of classes with me uh, as an undergrad years ago, was also my advisee, um, and took the sound and copyright class where I began to really uh, experiment, right, with these ideas on copyright and property and performance. Um, and so I, I actually taught that class last year, again, uh, since the first time I taught it. Um, and it's, you know, it's, Students are interested, honestly, right now in trying to figure out how to, uh, at least from my estimation, and, and trying to figure out uh, how to get themselves up on the algorithm, right? Because that's how you get discovered. Um, and, and, and with an awareness that these uh, platforms, these streaming platforms are not in their favor, but also understanding that there are very few other venues in which you know to be able to distribute their work uh, to a certain commercial sense. <clears throat> So that's definitely a focus. Uh, and I do think that there is more awareness around uh, ownership, right? Uh, but I don't I, I don't know if I don't know if I've heard, you know, uh, at least uh, sort of in, in, in my space, a lot of conversation as much around the organizing and thinking about, you know, what it means to sort of really state claims to your your work through uh, 
as a songwriter or as a producer, right? Uh, and how to sort of really maintain through different collectives and other ways uh, a certain level of control over your work by keeping your property rights as you also try to figure out other modes of distribution. But I do think that uh, folks are trying to think more creatively and are being uh, inspired and informed by moves by major artists like Meg Thee Stallion, right? So because they see someone like Meg who is able to maintain rights over their masters while still being distributed, while not having to sort of give away uh, you know, uh, uh, to to give away all of their work and still keep a, a majority share of it, they are sort of exploring these other ideas and ways. But again, you know, right now, just because there is so little money coming down the pipeline for actual artists, they are trying to figure out, you know, how to eat in you know the ways that are the most accessible as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, Alan Liu, you have a couple of questions also. Maybe just pick one of them for now. Uh, I'm just, it's a general statement and a question. You know, we, we're talking, we're throwing around black country here, which does have a very strong relationship to, to blackface and minstrelsy. Um, but I, I, and I haven't read your book and I apologize, I intend to, but I, I'd like to see, or wonder if the book you discuss more of the relationship between the Scotch Irish tradition and white country music and black country music. And if we get really get into the meat of actual early black hillbilly performers, because I never see any names on this. Everyone's talking about black country these days, but there's a lot of really important early black hillbilly record, recordings that I'm not going to start naming names because we don't have time, but I would like to see more specifics on that. I didn't know if in your book you had a chance to do that. Yeah, so my book does not go into country music specifically. My book stops at the turn of the 20th century with ragtime, essentially. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm glad that you have an interest, right, in uh, sort of black bluegrass because there's actually quite a bit of, uh, re there, there are quite a few resources out there now uh, that talks about early bluegrass and folk musicians. Uh, we can even start with the artists, right, like Rihanna and Giddens, who are uh, yeah. performative archivists and scholars who carry this. She's not, she's not. I'm sorry, she's not. She doesn't know anything about black country music. I don't oh, want to well, okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Wait, I'm sorry. I'm not going to have that conversation with you. We can okay. move. But I'm, I'm going now if you're not going to have that conversation. Thank that's you. So I'm not. I am not. Okay. Not with, not with you guys can never fine. name anyone specific. And Who you is you guys? Please and mute him. And I'm really sick of this crap. Goodbye. You, you can get off. Thank you. I'm going I'm to get off because this is just it's Perfect. just you're paid to do it because, you know, you very much you don't know what you're talking Why about. Why is he still talking? Please mute this man. Thank you, Kimberly. Yeah, now, okay. Out of order, out of line. I am not absolutely not hey, responsible. Carl, are you able to? Thanks. Thank you very much. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah, there are more questions. No. Okay. Oh, I'm, I don't know. oh, I'm sorry. No, Part go ahead. Who is interested, like genuinely, in the question of early Black country music? You know, I, um, you know, learning about like Etta Baker, Elizabeth Cotton, some of the early country soul blues pickers and their influence on um, grass would be a place to go or, you know, DeFord Bailey, you know, early on and early commercial country music. Those are just a few, but that person didn't really seem like they were interested in having an actual conversation. And a lot of the contemporary artists, uh, as we also understand, do a lot of the historical work, right? Uh, so people like Jake Blount has a whole entire website, right, that lists, you know, these Black Piedmont fiddlers and musicians, and it lists some of the resources and archives. And so this really is something that at this time, especially, is definitely growing as an interest, the investment in Americana, Black bluegrass, right? Uh, they are very much rooting themselves in the historical traditions that uh, uh, that our guest apparently is unaware of. Okay, let's move on then. Uh, Robin James, do you want to unmute and ask your question? If you're there still. Oh, on the train, do you want to read it? I can go ahead and read it if you'd like that or come back to you. Let's see. I'm waiting to see. Okay, I'll go ahead and read it. Let me uh, pull it up here. Okay. Okay, so the question is, I'm very excited to dig into your discussion of property in the book. Your mention here of legibility um, with property made me think of Tara Milius and Locke in the labor theory of value is ways to enclose the Americas 
Aida claimed that indigenous Americans supposedly labor on the land means they don't own it. Do you understand US music copyright law and black sound is genealogically connected to earlier forms of racialized enclosure like Terra Nullius? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm all the Metro North and unfortunately can't turn on the mic to speak. Sorry, I missed that. Sure. sure. Uh, and I would I would love to think about this more with Robin. We've had uh, sort of brief conversations about this. Uh, this uh, Terra Nullius, this idea that the land doesn't belong to anyone, right? And how that might apply to sound in that context. I think that we can actually see that through one of the anecdotes told about uh, Mama Lou in uh, a court case that took place around Tarara Bundie, uh, in which it was determined that the song itself by that time was public domain, aka it did not belong to anyone, right? So one of the things that I tried to work through is, you know, there's work by Lisa Gittleman and other scholars who think about, uh, while I did, I think Terra Nellius could absolutely be applied and thought to her and is a useful way to unpack uh, and move through. And I would be interested in sort of like how you think of, of its relationship and other ways of sort of moving through that term. Uh, and I think that one of the things that I was um, drawn to in this conversation is a deconstruction of uh, public domain. And I think those two concepts are related to one another because they both uh, sort of are about uh, you know, what is considered to be available for public consumption that does not belong or does not have a sense of containment of its own, right? And so it's different, of course, from uh, Terra Nellis because we're talking about like land and space that is essentially up for grabs, right? And so that's how people are able to go and inhabit, even though we know that that is not the case because often there are all people who were there or who are there or who have been displaced, right? Uh, and so I think that there is a conversation uh, between that term and the way I'm thinking about it in Black Sound, I would actually like to talk more with you about that, uh, Robin. Okay. Oh yeah, she's saying here, let me just, I can go ahead and she's responding. I think this connection between Terra Nilius and public domain is really interesting to think about. Let's talk more. Okay. Um, Aaliyah Symes has a question. I don't know if you want to unmute and ask your question. Hi, yeah, so I realized that um, considering what just happened, a uh, little finite, um, you mentioned that you stopped at ragtime with your book. Mm. Um, so maybe if you even have any kind of initial thoughts, but my research focus is on Afrofuturism and kind of world building and considering that your work kind of looks at the emergence of uh, black sound and how you know the popular popular music industry sorry kind of emerged from that i mm -hmm. wonder how we think about musical artists contemporary ones um who kind of center around afrofuturism and how that kind of informs the meaning making of their work especially since they're kind of in an industry that inherently kind of exploits um historically some of the foundational work that they're doing yeah, yeah. Thank you so much for that question, Aaliyah. That's a great um, uh, thought there. So, um, trying to figure out my approach to answering this because I have a particular way of my own sort of relationship to Afrofuturism as a term, uh, and so I will. I will one be a bit curious about how you think about Afrofuturism, and I might be able to better answer. Uh, um, uh, sort of relationship between, because, you know, Missy, Parliament, Sunrise, Outcast, and Elmo, they absolutely have things in common, but they also are all quite drastically different. So if, if the idea is of a group of Black artists who are foreshadowing or trying to imagine a new future that has a certain aesthetic to it, then I'm trying to figure out if that's what it is, or if there's some other aspect about uh, Afrofuturism that you're interested in uh, thinking through here in terms of Black sound. Um, I think... Right now, it's uh, the idea of kind of building towards an imagined sort of future. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I, because I get really complicated in the nitty gritty of it um, with my own research. So I think that would be just the simplest thing to ask in this moment in time. I don't want to take too much of your time. No worries. No, thank you for that. That makes sense. So maybe I can uh, do that by starting at rack time, right? Because uh, I think that where, where, I, where, I, where the book sort of ends, <clears throat> I think what's interesting uh, there, uh, as it relates to someone like Missy Elliott or Parliament of Funkadelic, is like if you listen to a piano roll of Jelly Roll Morton, for example, which I love to play in class, 
Uh, that's some futuristic stuff, okay? Harmonically, rhythmically, musically. It's also taking place in dance halls, right? Uh, in drinking halls, in halls of sex work, right? Uh, there are in, in, in places where people are looking to escape, uh, whether they are trying to imagine the future, whether they're trying to imagine a space outside of the current sort of conditions, right? Um, uh, uh, so I, I think that there is, in, 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 during enslavement, right? Uh, I think that you have, you know, Black people who are figuring out ways to uh, exist outside of their immediate condition, uh, or to create outside of their immediate condition, whether that is using music technology, right, using pans, using bowls to mute their mouths in the hushed arbor as they are worshiping and engaging in spirituals, right? And so, and just, in, I, I think that there's a long history and practice of creating and imagining uh, uh, new ways of existing, that, right? And so not, not necessarily a teleology of like moving forward or future, but outside of the sort of normalized conditions that one is experiencing, right? And I feel like for me, that's what I get uh, from Missy and, and Sunrise, Outcast and Janelle Monet, et cetera. Um, and so, so, so for me, that, that's how it, that's how it sort of, uh, uh, oh, 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 in relation to your question around Black Sound. Um, so the thing, uh, the, one of the ways that Black Sounds function, I'm glad you asked this because I can say this, uh, the one of the ways that Black Sound as an aesthetic trajectory functions, right, is that again, I talk about the movement from local to popular when things begin at a more localized musical regional level, and then they move into the popular sphere through commercial entertainment, right? Uh, I'm interested in that local moment, right? And the innovations and the musical practices that happen at that time. And you often find that those musical innovations are ones that are pushing against or challenging uh, the commercialization of previous sounds and aesthetics, right? Uh, and so I think that that may be a way to think about Black sound in relation to uh, these uh, this sort of constellation of artists who are constantly pushing us beyond while still negotiating and very aware and engaging with, right, the, the sonic and aesthetic history of the music that exists along the spectrum of American pop. Okay. Thank you so much. Hannah, would you like to ask your first question? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, you mentioned uh, uh, working with professionals like entertainment lawyers. So I guess what would be something you'd want uh, an entertainment lawyer on a young artist team, probably their first lawyer, to like take away from your book if they get to read it um, and how active you like want them to be, I guess, in helping ar guide artists toward a future of ownership because they are so focused on eating. <laughs> Right. Well, one of the things that I hope, honey, is that people understand after they read the book that uh, so sometimes people go into the industry with the clear intention of, you know, being a snake and making as much money as possible and taking advantage of people. You know, that happens. Uh, other times they move into an industry, kind of get an indoctrinated in just the ways and the systems without a full awareness, but still perpetuating. Right. So what I hope for in the book is that it makes it very clear uh, that they have to have an awareness of what their place is in this system that is designed to be exploitative. I mean, that's number one. And then you have to make your own decision from there, as I would say in class. Like you, you before you might have been able to navigate and move around as though, you know, you're kind of getting away. But but at, at this point, once you come into contact with this material, then you have to make a conscious decision, right, to move in this way or in that way. And then that is on you. But hopefully, you know, some part of you will try to you know, create some sense of equity within the system that, again, is designed for exploitation. That's like really what I hope. But again, you know. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for letting me ask my second one. Well, thank you so much to both of you. This was great. Thank you, Francesca. Thank you, Matthew. This was a wonderful conversation. Thank you all for coming. Uh, please join us next week when uh, Luis Manuel Garcia Mispareta will be in conversation with Marin Hancock to talk about his new book, Together Somehow, Music, Affect, and Intimacy on the Dance Floor. So we hope to see you next week. Good night. Thank you so much, everyone. Thanks, everyone.